It is a great privilege to open the grand final in this wonderful venue, but we are conscious of the fact that right now, hundreds of thousands of people remain trapped in the region of Donetsk because humanitarian groups are too intransigent, too unwilling to recognize the strategic calculus that they have made is a wrong one, and are unwilling to work with pro-Russian militias in ensuring the humanitarian corridor is open and those people get the relief that they need and don't risk their lives being lost in that conflict. We are proud to stand for a mechanism that says this should be a tool in the toolbox of humanitarian groups that allows them to make a decision that says it is important in some cases to ensure that we will work with these groups in order to ensure that relief gets to those who are most vulnerable. That means that we are not going to stand up here today and defend the idea of working with genocidal groups like Hutu militias. What we do stand for is making a reasoned calculation of working with groups like uh, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, or like the Tamil Titans, or like the Uyghurs, or like the Libyan militias, who have made it an important condition that in order for humanitarian groups like Medicine Soft Frontier to access civilians, that they also have to recognize and provide support to those groups on the ground. We think that that is an important thing that they do. So, why do we think that that's important? It does mean that you can possibly get the creation of a humanitarian corridor in which you literally evacuate large numbers of civilians from war-torn areas, from dangerous areas where people are being bombed, are at risk of death. We think that that is in and of itself an incredibly valuable thing. Secondly, it means that as we've seen with the Kachin group in Myanmar, that if you can actually work with those armed groups that are defined as illegal by the state, you can then provide clean water, you can provide education, you can provide very basic health care, you can ensure that people who have been injured are actually treated, because very often these are groups that simply don't have the resources to provide that. These are the kind of valuable things that we are talking about. So, the first thing that I'm going to bring you in my speech today is to talk about why these groups are presently cutting off uh, access to civilians. We think that it's very important to recognise here the kind of incentive structures these groups face. Fundamentally, people like the pro-Russian militias in Donetsk, people like the Tamil Tigers, are deeply suspicious of humanitarian groups like Christian Aid, like the Red Cross, like MSF. They are suspicious of them because they have been used in the past and could be used in the future to smuggle government propaganda and government support into those regions. They have a very real and legitimate suspicion about these groups. What's more, they have been identified in the past with the very state that they are often opposing. And that remains a very real barrier. And thirdly, they also just believe that they are protecting those civilians by their very existence, by the war that they are fighting. And so it is quite natural for them to make it a condition that they get recognition and support to their group if humanitarian relief is going to go to those civilians. For these groups, they identify the two things as being perfectly compatible. Give us resources, give us funding, we're protecting civilians, we're actually ultimately fighting for their long-term interests, and, on the other side of the coin, actually providing humanitarian relief to those people. So that is the overriding rationale for these groups, for these militias, uh, for people like the Tamil Tigers. Now, even if you don't buy that analysis, even if you take the most mercenary, unkind, ungenerous interpretation of their logic, we think that fundamentally they need civilian support in order to survive. They need civilians on side. They are constantly fighting a propaganda war in their country in which they have to be shown to be the ones that are, are ultimately interested in the long-term welfare of the people of that state too. Okay, if this is such a good idea, this principle is so important, why exclude genocidal groups? We think we I mean, come on, you cannot push us into defending the idea of actively supporting a genocide. We think that ultimately... <laughs> Ultimately, in the case of a genocide, there is no possibility for a humanitarian corridor or for providing relief to people because those people are going to be murdered, right? We think that often that genocide is an internal genocide, where it is an external one. We think it is like, quite uh, reasonable for humanitarian groups to make a calculus in which they determine where more lives will be lost, where they can make the biggest long-term impact. And the problem with what these guys have to argue for is that they want to deny the very existence of that tool. They want to have to deny whether or not humanitarian groups should be allowed to make that calculation, even where ultimately you can get much greater long-term gains. We think that that's a big problem. So, why does our model change that? It breaks that suspicion. Even if there is still a risk that Medicine Sans Frontier can smuggle in Western, uh, can smuggle in government propaganda and government arms, ultimately it doesn't change the relative equilibrium of power, right? Because even if you get more smuggling in, you've also got more funding and, and, and support flowing to the militia group. 
So the asymmetry doesn't change. That, for them, is incredibly important. Secondly, it creates a certain level of trust between the two groups, between the aid group and the militia. We think that that is valuable. And also it just meets their ideological agenda, right? It is a part of recognition, it is a part of affirming their place in that region, and that is important to them. What flows from that? It means that you do have an increased, uh, increased capacity to have a humanitarian corridor, to save hundreds of thousands of lives, and also to deliver material benefits to people on the ground. We think that if groups turn their back on that option, they are, if groups like Minnesota Sans Frontier turn their back on that option, they are fundamentally violating their primary duty, which is to protect the most vulnerable on the ground. Not to get themselves involved in domestic squabbling between state and illegal armed group about what is defined as illegality, about sovereignty, about where territorial lines should lie, but to be protecting women and children and elderly on the ground, those people that are most at risk of losing their lives in any conflict. That is their fundamental duty, and it is the right of those people on the ground to get that aid in the first place. No thank you. We think that this also prolongs the conflict, right? So even if you take the view that this is ultimately a long-term game, and this is not about uh, the primary duty and, uh, of humanitarian groups and the primary rights of civilians, we think that this ultimately extends the conflict. It extends the conflict because it means that these groups are more likely to have to turn to alternative sources of funding and support. That includes things like gaining control of diamond mines, as in the case of the west coast of Africa. We think that ultimately that extends the conflict into new areas. It risks even more people's lives. It also means that as with uh, certain groups in the Middle East, they have to ultimately turn to more and more radical networks of financing to get the support that they need. Why do they have to do all of that? Because of the analysis I gave you that they need civilian support, they need to be able to provide basic services, and if humanitarian groups won't do it, they will turn somewhere else. And ultimately that ends up with a much more radical militia. It ultimately ends up with the conflict going further and further out of the existing zone of conflict. For all those reasons, Mr. Speaker, we, we, we argue that this is ultimately consistent with the duty of humanitarian groups. It is the only model that is consistent with the rights of those people that are currently not being protected, and this is something that will ultimately uh, increase, the risk, uh, increase the chances of the conflict ending earlier. We are very proud of the proposal.